Okay, so that's recording. <coughs> thank you very much, Trish, for inviting me again. And thanks all of you for coming. So um, this is, will be the main character in the story I'm going to tell to you today. It's Paolo Macchiarini. He's an Italian a thoracic surgeon who used to be an honorary professor at UCL and uh, of the Karolinska Institute, where the scandal actually exploded. And he, had, in the picture, the photograph shows him in a German TV studio where already the whole scandal was known, but he was still celebrated as a hero. Because in Germany, we don't have medical scandals. We have just liberal law. Uh, so, sorry. Oh, all right. OK. So here's Macchiarini again, and this is basically su uh, summing up. Thoracic surgeon, stem cell pioneer, and he used to be a head of the thoracic sur uh, surgery in Carreggi in Florence, Italy, and professor at Karolinska Institute in uh, Sweden, the institute which gives out Nobel Prize in medicine. And this was their hope that by recruiting Macchiarini, they will get their share of the Nobel Prize once it all becomes uh, uh, f famous. So what Macchiarini did, he transplanted a number of patients with, with artificial tracheas. Some of them were made from cadaveric trachea, from dead patients, not a living trachea, uh, basically a piece of dead tissue. Uh, and tracheas <coughs> made of plastic. And they were seeded with bone marrow cells, and it was supposed to bring them alive. And ended up with al basically almost everybody dead. And there were quite a lot of people. Um, I was a bit sorry about it. So how did, it says, how did it get that bad? And this, the, those are the institutions that Macchiarini used to do his work. He started at, in Germany, medical, Hannover Medical School, and he still has a junk professorship there, by the way. And then he moved to Barcelona to the hospital clinic where he started with trachea transplants. After that, he went uh, to Florence uh, Hospital, the Karaji University Hospital, transplanted more patients there, at least five. And then he uh, had an honorary professorship at UCL, where one patient was transplanted by him, and he had to success. his partners transplanted even more. And then he moved to Karolinska, where he became a kind of associate professor, transplanted three patients, and then he also in parallel, while being paid a salary in Karolinska, he was actually working in Russia, where he transplanted, uh, in total it was five patients also, but probably even more. Um, so the question is, was it, so the official portrayal is that Macchiarini is a horrible person, which is true. He's a pathological liar, which is also true. But the lessons we learned, well, we sacked Macchiarini, so everything is fine now, right? Uh, there is a bigger problem, this is actually the system. And Macchiarini never did anything alone. There were a lot of other people involved who wanted the bit of fame which he promised them. And he actually, they actually not only wanted the fame, they also wanted the technology. And this is how it became so bad, not just because he's such a horrible person. So uh, what Macchiarini did here, stem cells are extremely hot, hot topic in in biology and medicine, the regenerative medicine is, because they, the promise is to cure all the diseases which are generally uh, normally not curable. And the hype is enormous. Uh, there is enormous amount of money in it, and this is what Macchiarini took advantage of. Of course, he has no biological background or regenerative medicine background. He's a surgeon, but he had big ideas. And whenever he ran into problems, he just changed the institution. I showed you all the many institutions he was working on. This is what also made it continue, because normally what happens when too many patient, patients start dying, the doctor is asked to stop if he wants to keep, he or she wants to keep the job. In Macchiarini's case, he was just sacked. He moved somewhere else, told new lies, to, uh, operated new patients, and this is how it could develop. And this is a very important bit. There's always an uh, assumption that science is self-corrected. Science is not self-correcting anything. It takes science decades to correct uh, something, uh, a, a minor research issue even. So in Macchiarini's case, 
science and medicine failed because they were either part of it or afraid. Uh, the few whistleblowers who reported something were punished and are still being punished. So the scandal was only uncovered by very, some very brave Swedish journalists, not just them actually, Vanity Fair. The, you know, the popular journal which tells about uh, the celebrity marriages and everything. They played their part in exposing the Macchiarini scandal. This is how embarrassing the whole thing is, that he needed Vanity Fair to expose the scandal. Um, and meanwhile, what the university was doing, they're basically doing de either damage control or distancing themselves from Macchiarini in order to use his technology to continue, which is even worse. So, and again, so as I said, it had, the, the scandal had it all. It, of course, it, it had this hype of stem cell regenerative medicine, the top journals were involved, one of the highest journals in medicine, The Lancet, is part of the scandal, and they're part of the actively, they're actively covering up the scandal, even now. The McKinney had very, is, was very well connected politically. The governor of Tuscany, it's him, Enrico Rossi, he's still, decry, uh, he, he's still crying about the loss of Macchiarini and how he should have stayed in Italy and uh, he's such a great surgeon. Um, and then it's, it is, of course, a, a scientific problem because Macchiarini's science is, is, a, is, is, is it's not supported by any evidence. It's just uh, an uneducated guess in his uh, case, and it's very simplistic. It's just basically very wishful thinking. Of course, he also manipulated data, and he lied about the results <coughs> and clinical outcomes. He committed ethics breach in every step. One doesn't even know to start in Macchiarini's case. Uh, what he did wrong, because he did wrong, everything wrong with his patients, everything possible. He never obtained ethical permits, he, uh, uh, he, he never recorded the patient cases properly even to hide his tracks. Um, the institutions uh, threatened the whistleblowers when they tried to report. The investigations were suppressed, uh, even if there, something was investigated, the results were suppressed, and I myself was sued by his right-hand man, and unfortunately, uh, lost in court uh, last week completely, not because my evidence was not valid, but because the judge decided that my evidence is boring and they prefer to trust the doctor. And they declared Macchiarini actually to be right. So, um, I'll now tell you a bit more in detail what happened. The cartoons are mine actually, uh, and I will upload it uh, online, so if you want to use them for your own talks, feel free. Why trachea? Because a trachea is an organ you cannot transplant. This is a slide made by Pierre Delare, who is a thoracic surgeon who developed his own method of transplanting a trachea, uh, which is very complicated. Uh, the problem is that, um, so, uh, that with a tra uh, of course, if you transplant an organ, it needs to be connected to the blood supply, otherwise it will die immediately, right? With, and well, you know, one can transplant liver, heart, kidney, a lot of other organs. This is where, those are organs where you can connect the central veins and arteries, and now they're supplied with blood, and they're sustained, and, <coughs> and they will remain alive inside the patient. This is something which you cannot do with the trachea, because the trachea uh, doesn't have a central blood supply, it's supplied by tiny capillaries, which surgeons cannot connect in time uh, uh, while operating, so, there is no way to transplant a trachea like you transplant a kidney, for example. So what Pierre Delare did, he puts it uh, into an arm of the patient, lets it slowly get vascularized there, and then he transplants it into an airway. Uh, so this, this is why it cannot be tra uh, transplanted normally. So this is what Macchiarini and others proposed. So we use a regenerative medicine. We take a dead scaffold, either a disorderized so here from a dead person, basically a, a con piece of connected tissues, or we take a piece of plastic. We, uh, we put what we call stem cells on them, which were bone marrow cells, which are not really, not stem cells, but um, they were declared to be pluripotent stem cells. We put it into a patient and we announced that it got immediately vascularized by magic, basically. There is no scientific explanation, just say it got vascularized. And of course, you collect funding, awards, fame, promotions, uh, uh, publish papers, 
When the problems arise, you have to silence critics, you hide dead patients, and then you continue as before. So the technical aspect, so what do you call your stem cells? Uh, the idea, so the main selling part of Macherini's method was that you no, do not need immunosuppressives to, when you transplant hysteria here, like with any other organs. When you transplant from one patient to another, you need to suppress the immune system, system or the organ will be rejected, the patient will die. So the main selling point was here that you don't need this because you use patient's own cells to go to here. It's their own to here. So which kind of cells are you going to use? Obviously, induced pluripotency was, didn't exist at that time that well, and anyway, the method is still not very well established. So basically, you announce that a certain type of the cells inside the patient is pluripotent, can make any kind of tissue, and can grow to here. And the cells which Macchiarini and his partners declared to be pluripotent, able to grow to here, are bone marrow cells. And bone marrow cells have a long history of research fraud and patient abuse. It started with very bad basic science, and this is a, a scientist, one of the scientists behind those claims. This is Catherine Verpai, who's, um, who is presently director of the Stem Cell Research Institute in, in Leuven, in Belgium, where Pierre Delare, actually, same university where Pierre Delare works, the Macchiarini critic. Uh, so her big success story uh, was that in, in Nature, published in 2002, where she declared that the cells inside our bone model are pluripotent, which means they can make every kind of cell types, like a very early embryonic cells. And this was what kicked off the whole hype uh, of bone marrow cells. Because of course, when something is published in Nature, it's a scientific fact, right? It's true, because <coughs> Nature. Um, so the Nobel Prize was almost saved. She was put on a stamp even, and in all the media. And then something happened. Um, turned out she manip uh, somebody manipulated data in those papers. She had a retraction on a related paper, on a related topic, because the data was fake. The Nature paper was never retracted. They published an enormous correction of this paper, uh, basically admitting that a lot of data was manipulated. But the paper was left standing. Why? Because by now, everybody knows that the bone marrow cells are not pluripotent. You do not leave a paper standing, even corrected, because if the main results are wrong. But the nature did it anyway, and this is why scientists could still claim that bone marrow cells are pluripotent because nature says so. And it's also eventually what Macchiarini indirectly based his research on. So basically nobody knows what these bone marrow cells can do, which uh, so it's, uh, obviously they produce blood cells, right? And there's a subtypes of the cells which are called mesenchymal stem cells. But they're not really, nobody knows what they're doing, but they're definitely not pluripotent. You definitely cannot grow it right here, which doesn't stop people even now from trying. So. A good slide to stop because we're obviously we're in Liverpool here, the University of Liverpool, and is here. Uh, so this is Anthony Holland. Uh, his current status is vice rector. Uh, uh, vice chancellor, well, very, very senior person in the university. And Anthony Holland was one of the scientists who followed this idea that bone marrow cells are pluripotent because, yeah, and he developed a technology to make cartilage out of them. Um, he has a company, Azalon, which patented it and marketed it. And in here, this is the important bit, this is from the screenshot from the French University site. In 2008, Professor Holland and the team of scientists and surgeons successfully created and transplanted the first tissue in Genitra here using patients' own stem cells. And this is where the Macchiarini story started, with a Trahir transplant of 2008 might have heard of it. It was a huge news story. Even I remember seeing it, although I wasn't working on exactly on that field. Um, Macchiarini was at that time in Spain, in Barcelona. And he tried, this is a patient, Claudia Costillo. And he didn't replace her trachea. He replaced the bronchus. 
So to here is a Y-formed organ. And uh, the bronchus is one of the branches that, uh, and goes to each of the lungs, right? So you have to understand that the difference between replacing a trachea, the main part, and replacing a bronchus is that if the bronchus fails, the patient loses the lung, right? If the trachea fails, the patient loses life because you can't, it will suffocate. You know, if the bronchus fails, one lung collapses, but the other lung can be used. So this was happened in her case. It was published in Lancet in November 2008. By that time, the graft fails. The patient needed stents to keep it open. Of course, it's not in the paper because it's not relevant, right? And it, it, it got worse and worse and worse. The, this woman, in year, in two years ago, she really went to the hospital asking to have to remove her lung and the graft to, because she had enough uh, of suffering. And after they did that, she feels great. So, um, but this back then and even now, it's being sold as a success story. And this is a so hair transplant team. Paolo Maccherini, obviously, was his Spanish patient. Um, this is his right-hand man, Philip Jungeblut, who was with Maccherini, starting from that very first operation to the, basically, to the very recently, where they both sacked in Karolinski Institute, and who sued me in court and won because uh, the judge thought he is more trans trustworthy than anything I say, right? And this is Martin Virchel, uh, uh, Professor of Laryngology in, in UCL, in London. Back then, he was in Bristol. So he was in charge of preparing the trachea for Claudia using Anthony Hollander's technology. Um, and, uh, uh, well, the problem was that Martin Birchall at that time was a professor at a veterinary institute uh, uh, department. So his lab was a veterinary lab where he was operating on pigs. <coughs> He didn't, st it didn't stop him to prepare human graft in a pig lab. Uh, he simply didn't tell it to the authorities that he was doing it. Uh, and that kind of makes it right because, I mean, if you don't tell to authorities, it's not lying, right? So it's okay. Apparently, this was the logic. Uh, so they pretend they never had a truck here in the lab, which doesn't make any sense. So the principle to here regeneration is again a, a diagram by Pierre de Lara is that you take this, uh, this couples, you put <coughs> bone marrow cells, which you call stem cells on them, and then you say, well, now it's living through here, I put it inside, and it miraculously will grow blood supplies out of nowhere. And this is Claudius of Philostrachy in the Birchall's veterinary lab in Bristol. Right? The photograph of it in the lab, which they said no, was never there. Um, <laughs> and this is Martin Birchall, there's something here actually never, never, never liked or wanted to see or had anything to do with plastic to here. Back then, it was different. Uh, so, again, to discuss some science behind it. Why would bone marrow cells produce cartilage around cellular trachea? There's no scientific explanation why they would do it, because, so well, let us assume it's magic. And why, uh, why would it survive without blood supply when put in a patient? Uh, because also magic. Magic makes blood vessels grow with light speed towards a dying, bunch of dying cells sitting on a dead carcass and saves them. Uh, so Maccherini pumps up his patients with erythropoietin, which has huge side effects, makes blood clot, uh, probably also led to some of the deaths uh, because of it. Uh, because he just decided erythropoietin is a blood thing. <coughs> so probably it makes blood vessels grow, so let's put it into patients. This is how it worked. And of course, how can plastic trachea become a living trachea? This makes no sense, right? But because it wasn't simple plastic, it was nanotechnology plastic. Right? It's nan nanotechnology is, is a magic thing, so people uh, associate a lot, uh, make something which doesn't make any sense at all, but you put nanotechnology in it, and suddenly it's, it's something great. So, and then practical considerations. The first patient, Claudio Castillo, which I told you about, that we here was regenerating a bioreactor, this little box I showed you before, in a Bristol lab, this is a bioreactor. Uh, 
as it sits in there and it gets, it swims in a solution, it has to be rotated all, all the time, and that's the bioreactor. Uh, and they're very difficult. Of course, you, you can't do it in a, in, a, in a pig lab. You need a, a GMP certified lab for human uh, uh, use, and uh, uh, you need a bunch of approvals. So <laughs> and because he needed too much uh, paperwork, McKinney decided just to, to skip the bioreactor and they say, human body is the best bioreactor there is, so just put a dead piece of trachea, dissolved trachea in it, cover it with stem cells, and <coughs> say, that's enough. And uh, just close the patient, and that's it. And of course, don't forget erythropoietin to, to make the vascularization. <coughs> Another problem here in here, the cadaver actually here, a bit of a mess. You need donors, donor approval. The deceleration process is, takes very long and is very expensive and actually destroys the here. It becomes very soft and floppy after decelerization because, of course, you removed all the cartilage. Uh, and Maccherini noticed it. He noticed that his patients are dying because of cadaver here uh, because it was collapsing. He said, let's take something more rigid, which is plastic and put it in. And, that, uh, uh, and that's how he switched to plastic to here. Of course, every surgeon would have told him, and he <coughs> should have known, that if you put plastic as a trahir replacement human being, you will kill this person, because trahir is a moving organ. Uh, uh, so it goes from here to here, somewhere, and it moves all the time. Whenever you breathe, it moves. So when you have a plastic tube moving inside you, it starts staring up at the other surrounding tissues, like esophagus, and so on. And this is exactly what happened. But Macherini's argument, ah, but this is not normal plastic. It's non-structured plastic with stem cells on it. So, uh, and this was the argument. Because that's why it had eventually got published in Lancet. This is the patient, Andemar <coughs> Bayer. He was the first patient who was with the plastic trick. It was published in Lancet. He died two and a half years after. Uh, was quite slow and horrible death. Uh, he didn't need a life-saving operation because he was not immediately dying. But Maccherini was desperate to use a plastic trachea, and Karolinska was pushing him to transplant somebody with a plastic trachea. So basically the patient was arrived at Karolinska for an examination, but Maccherini told me, we're transplanting you, come on, sign here. And this is what happened. Um, the outcomes, Maccherini had nine patients that we know who received a plastic to here. Eight of them are dead. The only survivor uh, was lucky because the piece he received was high enough that it could be removed and he's still alive with a tracheostomy, a Russian patient. Uh, at least 12 patients received a cadaveric to here, probably much more, from Maccherini and uh, Martin Burchell. They used to be big partners, and they had a huge fight over, over patents, so they, the French depended over money, actually. Uh, from those patients, maybe two, maximum two or three are alive. Two we know are alive, and it's Claudio Castillo who is alive, who saved herself by, the, by asking to have her lung removed, and the other patient who is alive is this boy, Kieran Lynch, and he was operated in, uh, in, uh, in London uh, eight years ago, <coughs> And he received a cadaver actually here with stents, and that's why he's still alive. The interesting thing, which I published just uh, uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday, I think, um, new evidence came out that Martin Borschel wanted to be the first man to use a synthetic tray here, plastic tray here, and his choice candidate was Kieran Lynch. He wanted to fix him in the year 2010 already with a plastic tray here to, to be faster than Macherini, I presume. Because UCL was at that time preparing, making plastic grafts, vascular grafts, and Virgil had an idea, well, if you can make plastic blood vessels, let's make plastic to here. Um, Kieran Lynch was incredibly lucky because the lab which made the plastic to here was not ready at the time, so they didn't make it. They got a cadaver to here from Italy, delivered by Maccherini from Italy. Mac Maccherini was a member of the operating team. They installed it, the boy survived. We don't know much about it. We only have Burchell's own papers telling us what happened. And uh, two and a half years later, it was published in Lancet, the, uh, the, 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 the story. Oops, 
Ah, right. I, uh, again, I made a mistake. It was supposed to be the other Lancet paper showing the Kiran Lynch story. Very sorry. Um, Makirin was removed of the paper because by then, Burchell and him stopped being friends. <coughs> okay. And this is very kind of, I, I, well, cynical comparison, I know, but I'm just showing the perspective of doctors like Machiarini. It's not something I, uh, I know how it sounds, but it's basically you compare pig versus patient, whom you want to do your research on. So if you imagine you're a person like Machiarini or even Martin Birch, because he really said he, pigs are stupid, I want to operate, I test research only on humans. There's those are alternatives if you want to test the heel transport. So let's see what you can do with pigs. Pigs is a pig is an animal the size of a human, so the organs are similar size. Uh, but you need ethics approval. Uh, animal research needs approvals, especially dangerous animal research. You make animals suffer. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to get approved, you, uh, and they're very very expensive. So pigs are very expensive to do research on. <coughs> you need of course controls. You need pigs treated. Is it plastic tree here or cadaver tree here? Pigs treated, not treated, pigs, pigs treated with, I don't know, a different kind of uh, comparative uh, 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 treatment so you can compare it in between. So it has to be properly scientifically controlled. And many scientists don't like controls because controls spoil everything. Uh, well, what is it? You, if you, you operated 12 pigs and only one survived, you cannot publish just the one pig, right? <laughs> uh, you have to publish the other 11 as well. And then there goes your success story. The media is not interested. Nobody uh, will write about how you successfully transplanted a trachea into a pig. Guardian won't write, BBC won't write, nobody. Uh, and of course, other labs can do the same. They get their own pigs and test your matter and say, look, well, I repeated it and my pigs all died. So how come yours were alive, as you claim? And, then that's, and, what's, and this is where the beauty of <coughs> patient research is beauty. Marks over here. Uh, because you don't need ethics approvals for patients. You think you need them, you don't. Because there's such thing as a compassionate use. And compassionate use, or hospital exception, means you as a treating doctor says this patient is dying. So the only way to save this patient is to do whatever I think is necessary. And this is where you really you can get a minimal ethical approval by your own hospital, or you can even skip to even this, because you are in a hurry. I'll show you examples where it really happened in Germany, where absolutely no ethical approvals were made, and uh, it was still legal, apparently. Um, you don't need contrast, obviously, you just have one patient. If the patient survives, it's a success story. You don't have to explain why the patient survived. If the patient died, they never existed. Nobody forces you to report dead patients, right? And this is what also happened in Machiarini case. Because whenever, you, whenever they applied for funding, out of the 12 patients I told you about, only two existed, Claudia Castillo and Kieran Lich. Everybody else actually never existed. Or they pretend to, because they were dead. Uh, so actually, you only announced those to the, in papers and also funders, actually, not just media, but also funders. And of course, you go on media. And nobody can challenge you, because of course, they can't, uh, only you have access to the patient. Unlike with, <coughs> with animal experiments, where you have to re eventually release all the data if somebody insists, with patients, it's all patient confidentiality. Another trick is to put, when you do such crazy things with regenerative medicine, you have to put it where, somebody, where, where it can't be seen. And this is Harold Ott, another great hero of regenerative medicine in the US, and he can make all kinds of organs, which he claims to. He, at, at least he never tested on patients. One of his claims that he can grow an leg. He just takes the leg of a rat, uh, cuts it off uh, of a dead rat, removes all the cells of it, puts bone marrow cells on it, and he says it becomes a living leg. It was reported by uh, what new scientists and other media as if it was a proper science, which is not. But imagine if he really transplanted it on a rat, and he would everybody everybody would ridicule him because you can see that it's a rotting piece of dead leg hanging on a rat, right? And it's a beauty, when you put a rotting piece of dead trachea in a patient, you can't, nobody can see it. So nobody can prove to you that you actually are cheating. 
Um, so this is something which Pierre Delard uh, uh, exemplified with a thumb. Basically, for, he used the model of a thumb. This is a measure you take, put, put to, uh, you take a, a patient without a thumb, and you um, uh, take, take, take a dead donor's thumb, remove all the cells, and just suture it on. Imagine how it will look, right? You cannot sell this as a success. But with the here, you can, because it can be seen. And, and this is another argument. Can you say that I want to do it? Because obviously I have a patient without a thumb or a leg. There is no medical way to grow a thumb or a leg, right? The patient is uncurable, right? This is the logic behind it. And this is how you can get your hospital exemption, because they, obviously there is no therapy for replacing a leg or replacing a thumb. So you make one in this method and put it onto a patient. This is exactly the same logic with a trachea transplant. A number of these patients were not dying at all. They were in a situation where they could not be treated because they had a hole in their uh, throat, a tracheostomy, which is a stable situation. As long as you don't go swimming, you're sw safe, right? Uh, it's very inconvenient for patients, and that's why they agreed to have this transplant. But the point is, they were not dying. Their lives were not in danger. But the argument was, but they can't be helped, right? So let's test it on them. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and of course, you have to publish very quickly before you run into trouble. And this is what they did in Lancet. So this is the paper which uh, 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 about the Stephen Lynch two and a half year follow-up study. A lot of authors, not a single one of them is Macchiarini, though he was one of the surgeons who brought it. He operating and who brought the track here. So this is <laughs> how it sometimes works. And this is a paper of, uh, about Claudio Castillo, and this is a five-year follow-up paper, which is just better. basically a fairy tale by Macchiarini, where he, he was just inventing things as he went along. Lancet knows it. They know exactly what happened. But for the Lancet, Paul Macchiarini is not guilty of scientific misconduct. They, this is the editorial issued by Richard Horton, he never retracted his editorial or corrected it. I put in different ones. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Macchiarini is guilty of scientific misconduct, and maybe I should retract this paper. No. Not a single Macchiarini paper in Lancet was retracted yet. OK. And sometimes you just need to blame the patient. Um, so what, this is what Macchiarini did. So, he at some point assumed that if he operated cancer patients, they were not, <laughs> by the pretense of saying their lives, uh, they were too weak to profit from his great technology, which was obviously nonsense. And besides, those patients were not even dying. They had a very slow-growing form of cancer. But anyway, this was Machiavellian's logic. So I have a method which is great, but my patients are not good enough for it. So what I need are healthy patients. And this is where he switched to patients we had, which had no life-threatening disease, which were uh, victims of a car accident where they had, were left with a hole in their throat, with a tracheostomy, with a damaged trachea. They could have gotten very old if he didn't operate them. But this is what he did. This was Julia Tulik. If you saw the uh, uh, Swedish documentary, she was featuring pro prominently in it. And this is David Green the, uh, from the Harvard Operators talking her into accepting a piece of plastic as a trachea replacement. This is uh, Yeshin Chetty, a, a young woman from Turkey, who also, uh, he, she didn't even have a tracheostomy. She had, uh, uh, she had damaged trachea and, uh, and she needed lung drainage from time to time. But she didn't even have a tracheostomy then. And still, Macchiarini replaced her trachea with a piece of plastic and it got worse and worse and worse. Both patients received it. The trachea collapsed, they got a second piece of plastic and put in them, it collapsed again, and eventually uh, Yulia Tulik died alone at home. And Yashim Chetia uh, was brought to Philadelphia where they replaced trachea, oesophagus, and I think even one lung, and it still didn't help her. She died in 2016, I think. Or 17, early 2017. And now her family is suing uh, the company of this guy for, ma uh, for making the materials and as associating with Macchiarini. So 
this is the perverse logic when you say, instead of thinking that my technology is killing my patients, you say, no, oh, my patients are sabotaging my technology by dying. So I need healthier patients. This was Machiavelli's logic. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, and he still says that they're all very, very sick and dying. Actually, he saved them. And he, all the accusations he says are jealousy. He has again, eight of nine are dead. It's classic that you keep it. <coughs> the ones with cadaver, actually, we don't even know how many they are. I'm still <laughs> trying to find it out. Uh, we only know the ones which, which he himself will left records about. Maybe two or three are survived. <coughs> this woman is one of the survivors, but she is not doing very well. So uh, we don't know how, how it will develop. And uh, yeah, meanwhile, uh, old Martin Birchall had even his poster in the, in the parliament celebrating his success stories. While the patients were dying already there, so that's why you have to control the facts of the past to control the future of your regenerative medicine project. And wh when the scandal broke, uh, Martin Birch and also his partner Mar Martin Elliott, who is a pediatric surgeon who transplanted uh, Kieran Lynch, and also this girl, uh, they say that uh, uh, everything was Machiavelli's fault, and they were always against plastic to heal. And the problem is, of course, Birchall wanted to be the first one, apparently, to just put plastic to here on a child. You never test unproven medicines on children. It's just a very sick thing for the doctor to try. But that was the idea. Uh, and of course, this patient, uh, this girl was uh, basically experimented upon in every possible way. They just wanted to test several things in the same time. They wanted to test uh, to transplant her without a stent because to sell their technology later on, they wanted to say that the patients don't need a stent. They knew that every, every single patient needed a stent because the tahirs were collapsing, but they wanted to prove that, she, but it works with, that it works without a stent so they didn't put a stent when they transplanted her with a cadaver to here. They wanted to prove that the trachea can be frozen. Why is it important? Because if you want to do a clinical trial on like 50 patients, you need a, a stock of tracheas, right? And you keep them in a fridge, in a freezer. So for that, you, you have to defrost them and then put in a patient. For this girl, a fresh trachea was frozen and defrosted to prove that it's possible to use defrosted trachea. So both things, defrosted trachea, though they knew because it weakens the integrity of the graft. They knew it from the lab test, but they had to prove it from the clinical trial. It was Martin Birchall and also Martin Elliott because he was in charge of this patient. Another thing, they, they didn't want to put a stent because if they put a stent in, they will be told, well, there's no benefit, right? Why should we need anybody to put your, pay your trachea? They want to prove we don't need a stent for this patient. They do the, all these things to Shona Davison. Two weeks later, she was dead. And after that, she ceased to exist. Nobody mentions her anymore, except when they occasionally passed a lie in this publication where they said, well, she was dying, actually, and we saved her life. Uh, unfortunately, she died from unknown causes. We don't know what killed her, but her life qu quality was incredibly improved. And the thing is, there's a BBC documentary about this girl, but you can see her, how relatively well she was. And two weeks later, after the transplant, she was dead. Which kind of quality of life and life extension it was? Um, but, yeah, but the, the idea is that, of course, the uh, cadaveric trachea, the one which killed Shona Davison, and one which also killed Keziah Shorten before Shona, basically Shona was operated, <coughs> Well, uh, let me see if I get the dates right. Uh, well, Keziah was dying, already, already dead, from the same technology. And Keziah died because they removed the stent. So basically, the logic is we killed one patient by removing a stent from a cadaveric trachea. So let's do it again. Maybe it, it works this time. Right? 
Um, Kezara Shorten also is in this paper, declared that she was saved and her quality of life was extended. Um, she was operated in Italy by Macchiarini. What I found out that UCL was involved. She was a UCL patient while she was treated in Paris, uh, by Macchiarini in Italy, operated by Macchiarini in Italy. NHS paid for it. The transplant, the operation was organized by UCL, but after it went completely, uh, uh, became a complete disaster where a young girl was tortured to death, basically. UCL pretended they had absolutely nothing to do with this transplant. They even went to the land. In a Swedish documentary about Makirin, when you watch it, Kazaya's story is being told because she received, when she was almost, when she was dying, they put a plastic tray in, into her, allegedly to save her as a palliative measure. But it actually looks like they were thinking, well, she's going to die anyway, let's test a plastic tray on her. <coughs> so they managed to make it look like it was Macchiarini who put a plastic tray in her. When you watch the documentary, the association is in this way. Basically, they play the journalist by telling them bullshit. In fact, Macchiarini was against putting a plastic tray into her because he knew it will curl her. Macchiarini knew that very weak patients should not receive plastic tray because it will kill them. UCL did it anyway. Um, so this is a, basically a team which uh, of UCL. This is Martin Birchall, this is Mark Laudel. He's a man of charge of making trachias uh, for UCL. And this is Martin Elliott, who was responsible for this patient, and also uh, Kiran Lynch. Okay. Uh, 2007, uh, 17, as I mentioned to you, just when I was giving my talk in Liverpool, uh, before that, I was at UCL, invited as a witness, and I gave a testimony in front of this commission. And I really, at that time, I thought they mean it seriously, but uh, I can't read people, I admit, so I, I really felt for it. It was a scapegoating non-investigation. What they did, they just, uh, it was a whitewashing exercise to protect Birchall and others. And they blamed Alexander Sefalian, this is him, with Birchall student. And then they hold the gut plastic to here. Of course, what Sefalian did was not right. But the point is that Sefalian is not qualified to decide about such things. He's not a doctor, he's not a biologist, he's a physicist. He was making plastic material. They blamed him for failing to provide, to obtain the certificate, to verify the ethics permits uh, uh, for operations in Sweden, uh, and things like that. Um, so here, a bit more details. This was a Guardian article which was published, that, which made Guardian look like a, a PR agency of UCL, uh, where, where they basically, with Birchall was not mentioned even once in this article, like, he has nothing to do with it. In fact, the, the, the whole report protected him and the others, Martin Elliott and Paul de Coppi also, from any negative association. Um, they didn't publish certain information, so I obtained uh, some records of this uh, investigation. And it turned out the investigators knew that Martin Burchard planned to use a plastic tray here in 2000, December 2009 on Kieran Lynch to be the first man who transplanted a plastic tray here. I would think it is a bit of re relevant bit of information if you have a trachea transplant investigation going on at UCL, right? No, it's a boring bit, bit. You don't want to bore your audience. It's nowhere in the report. Nowhere. And they knew it. Uh, so there are other things they omitted. Um, so, for example, yeah, the main finding was that Alexander Sefalen manufactured the plastic trachea and also vascular grafts in a non-GMP certified lab, as if it matters. Yeah. Of course, it is supposed to be GMP certified lab, but the point is UCL knew it. They didn't care. They approved the export of the tracheas. <coughs> Their cadaveric trachea were not made in GMP certified labs. It doesn't, nobody bothers about it. And the bit is, well, they cannot, they, 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 you know, the head of the investigation said it was something frightening finding that we found out that he was doing plastic trachea and send them to Sweden or to, to and vascular craft and send them to India or, or Iran. Behind everybody's back, nobody knew. You know what? The investigators were discussing with Seyfalian about a plastic nose he made, <laughs> which was implanted <coughs> a patient in UCL. 
So basically, everybody knew in UCL, the investigators knew, that they were making plastic uh, grafts, plastic organ replacements, using them at UCL, and they were not GMP certified. So how can you blame Sir Palant for doing something which he was told to do by his superiors at UCL? But of course, as they did it, and he was denied the right of appeal. Normally, if you're found guilty in a misconduct investigation of something, you, have to, you can appeal, and it goes back, and before the report published, your right of appeal has to be exhausted. But because it was not officially a misconduct investigation, you know what they did? Like two hours, one or two hours before they published the report online, they sent Sefali an, an email telling him, Alex, can you, uh, you can come to our office and have a look at the report. They gave him half an hour time. He, I don't think he ever read it, it's 70 <coughs> pages. But this, the time frame he was getting, the time when the email was sent and the time when the report was published was like two hours. Because, uh, yeah. And the worst bit, they concluded that we need more experiments. Because obviously, yeah, there are too many patients died. Uh, so we need to operate more to see if the method works. It's a strange logic, but yeah, they decide to do it. So, and this is actually what happens. Um, There are already there, there were three clinical trials. Um, uh, I think I have to hurry up, so I'm very sorry. Um, Inspire, which was supposed to be four, so here transplant patients, the phase one trial, phase two trial funded by European Union, and uh, another phase one trial <coughs> on 10 patients to replace larynx. And there's a Liverpool-based company, really, uh, which organized all these trials. Uh, this is their CEO and this is their technology. How the current status is, they're all derailed. The Inspire and Training Box trials were suspended, also because of my reporting, I'm so happy about it. And Tetra <coughs> can go anyway because it's a phase two trial. And even European bureaucrats understand that you can start phase two without results from phase one. So basically the money will be just wasted, but the patients are almost safe not entirely safe, even if those trials are not going anywhere, they are still compassionate use, right? And this is why UCL, and they had almost the hope to transplant that child into <coughs> In May last year, with a cadaver extract here, under compassionate uh, use, it only came out in the investigative report. We still haven't heard of the results, not published, nothing. We don't know how the child is doing. If it was a success, they would probably have told us, but they're not. Well, <coughs> on the other side, Peter and Jen understood that kind of this is not happening. There's no so they put an announcement where they seek partners in uh, Asia and United States for their to hear te transport technology. And here's an important bit. This is Trish. And what she did, she, um, she formed the Parliament Science and Technology Committee. And uh, there was a big, uh, <coughs> a big letter and a follow-up and what Trisha and Rafael Levy uh, asked is that uh, there should be a proper investigation, not this joke which UCL did. And uh, I should, of course, stop all clinical trials and also compassion use cases be, uh, before they figure out what actually happened. And a very elementary thing is that you do not test on humans before you test it in the lab, like on animals. And finally, that the United Kingdom should reform its uh, research integrity oversight because Normally, it's university investigating themselves, and we know from UCL <coughs> what turns out if they do it. So the result, the trials were officially suspended, uh, and Swish even appeared in Science. Uh, so there's an article reporting about the uh, stop of these two clinical trials of uh, Burchell and his partners, and uh, of course, Swish is <coughs> being cited there. It's strange that the University of Liverpool didn't make a press release about it. <laughs> Should have, no? <laughs> okay. Um, so, the, the it's kind of last uh, summing up of Macherini. I can stop afterwards, if you, if, depending on the time you have to say. Um, so, these are the countries where Macherini did his work. So, in Spain, there was no investigation. Nobody knows how many patients he transplanted there. Uh, and very exactly, because apparently there were other hospitals he was using. Uh, 
in Italy, no investigation in Careggi, where he had at least five patients. He's still supported from the politicians. He might even be still working in Italy, because I heard some rumors. But at least there was some good journalist who exposed his deeds already early on. And as Corriere Fiorentino did it. In Sweden, it was actually the only country where media did a good job of exposing the scandal. It started with a Swedish TV documentary, and then it grew, the newspapers went, went on it. So actually, all Swedes are informed about the Bakirini scandal. Some people had to step down. There was even uh, criminal prosecutions <coughs> which started to investigate the charges of manslaughter. Unfortunately, <coughs> Uh, just really shows how legal expert thinks. And this is really, so we are investigating somebody who abused patients by unethical tracheal transplants. And we need some expert advice on it. That's what the Swedish prosecutor. So whom should we ask? Let's ask somebody who also did unethical tracheal transplants and was found as guilty of misconduct. This is what they did. They really asked two surgeons who themselves were found guilty of misconduct of transplanting a trachea with the same technology, patient died afterwards, and what kind of advice? Of course they said that, uh, yeah. And based on their advice, the charges were dropped. So even in Sweden, such things happen. In Russia, very interesting, Russians uh, did the Russian thing, actually. <laughs> they learned from Makerini the technology of tracheal regeneration, hired him, and set up their own business. They announced in the biggest Russian medical newspaper that they have a cadaveric trachea technology ready to be used on a patient. No mention of Macchiarini at all. <laughs> they are not, so uh, in Germany, uh, Germany is really where Macchiarini is a hero. Uh, he's still an adjunct professor at uh, Hanover Medical School. Nobody knows why. Uh, unpaid, but he's still carries a professor degree because of it. If you search German uh, news about Macchiarini and his partner Jungeblut, who sued me, almost everything is positive. Jungeblut is never mentioned in any negative context because obviously they watched what being done to me in courts and they decided, well, let's leave it. So this doctor's practicing. Um, uh, so this is a situation and uh, the, the court case was completely bizarre. Um, do we, shall I continue? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was went so much over time. Okay, so I'll, you know what, I'll put it online. Th that is, the, uh, and uh, basically all the information will be on the slides. And uh, the stories about Motra here transplant as other than Macchiarini. And you can maybe read it afterwards. I'm very sorry that I went so much over time. Okay. <laughs> Uh, 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 it's my contact. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is uh, this was Yasim Chetty, the girl from Turkey, and um, yeah. Um, so there was no media reporting about this. There was just uh, one. Actually, no. Yeah, there was basically no media reporting about the story. And um, her family is suing the company which produced the bioreactors for Macchiarini. And they might be also suing Macchiarini as well, but it's not like he is going to uh, appear in front of the court in the U.S. <coughs> which is going to be downstairs by the reception and then if I can ask everyone to be back for half